Hello. We hope everybody had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we wish you a healthy and prosperous 2024. So today we're in the kitchen and I'm gonna try my hand at something that I've never done before, and it's Cajun gumbo. You have sausage, shrimp, and some other vegetables in there. So we're gonna try it, see how tasty it ends up. First, I'm gonna put my butter in there. Oh, it starts down oh, here. Yeah, down here. Oh, we should show them that setup. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, muffin has already. Tim's sous chef. <laughs> He's got I'm everything. The chef. <laughs> He's got everything in these little bowls to help make cooking a little easier. Yeah, I've chopped up the onions. I've yep. chopped up the pepper. Got two celery stalks. I'm not going to chop them up because I'm going to take them out once it flavors the gumbo. And then I've chopped up the andalulis and the other things Muffin has ready. So I'm going to turn this on medium heat. And for some reason or another, our oven and stove top is hotter than normal. So I'm gonna turn it on just a little less than medium. First, thing, first two things I have to put in is the butter and flour. And I'll make a little concoction that's supposed to be kind of a caramel color. It goes from eight to 15 minutes, but when the color's right, that's when I'm gonna start adding some other things to it. Yeah, the Christmas season has come and gone and we, we're festive people, so we've been playing Christmas carols on the, the whatever that thing is. Oh, through Sirius Radio. Yeah, Sirius Radio. <laughs> and it's non-commercial, so uh, we've enjoyed that. We've been playing it through the house, and we had decorations up, and it's just sad that it's all over with in one day, mm -hmm. but that's how it is. We just uh, are hopeful and prayerful that we'll be here next year to enjoy it again. This is a very, very unusual winter that we spent here in the North Woods. Normally, I have at least eight to 11 snow piles where I've plowed snow with a tractor. I've only plowed one time this year, and uh, actually you can look out in the side yard and under the trees, you can see ground. There's no snow. And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining a bit. <laughs> but it's allowed us to have decent weather as we healed up and uh, I know the snowmobilers are really, really sad because they're not able to get out and ride their machines. But uh, I'm sure we'll pay for it, but it's not hurting my feelings right now that we don't have snow. And the temperatures have been warm. Like I say, watch me pay for it dearly, mm. but we, we've not been below zero this year and this time last year we were at it wasn't uncommon to be 10 15 degrees below zero at night and then new england got hit with that terrible cold snap around christmas last year 2022 and it was the coldest that it had been in this area and a lot of other areas up here and it's the coldest it's been in 60 years. The wind chill here was 52 below zero. This is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, the butter's melted. I'm gonna put the flour in here. So you're making a roux. You said it. <laughs> we watched a guy on YouTube 
and uh, I don't know his name, but his uh, channel, I believe, is called Truck Life. And he has like a log cabin on the back of his Ford F-350 diesel. And he's, he lives in Alaska. And he was attempting to go to the Arctic Circle and camp in the Arctic Ocean. But the last hundred miles or so, they closed it because of trucks off, you know, blocking the road and so forth, so he couldn't make it. But anyway, in his cabin on the back of his truck, he made some gumbo. And my mouth was watering when I saw that. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna try my hand at making some gumbo. And so, here I am. wasn't too long ago that I could not have tolerated standing this long. Uh, my back still gets a little angry, but because of the primary pain I had was a hip that had scared the cartilage off. <laughs> And it was bone on bone, and it had even protruded somewhat up into the socket or acetabulum of the hip joint. And so the day after Thanksgiving, I went in and had a hip replacement. Wonderful doctor, wonderful staff up here at the Northern Light Hospital in Presque Isle, Maine. And I can't thank them enough, the doctor especially, for the work he did. My back still gets a little angry, but the hip is doing really well. The morning that I got ready to have the hip replacement, the doctor came in and he said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm doing pretty good. I said, the, the only nerve-wracking part is having been in the medical profession, I know what you're going to do. And he laughed. And he said, well, if it makes you feel any better, I've had practice twice already this week. But And that's where the old saying, sometimes ignorance is bliss. I've seen hip replacements performed and knee replacements, shoulder surgeries, and sometimes knowing what they're going to do is a little more than you want to know, but it's all, it's all well and good as long as somebody else. But then when it comes time to, to have it done yourself, it's like I told the doctor, you know, I've always been on the providing end of medical services, and it's not so easy being on the receiving end. The procedure I had was one that, when I was in the medical profession, was not a common thing. Matter of fact, I've never heard of it until just recently. And this relatively new procedure, which is probably maybe a dozen years old, uh, is called a direct anterior approach. And in the past, you had either a lateral or posterior approach to putting in a prosthetic hip. And that involved cutting 
either from behind or the side, cutting muscles and putting in the prosthetic hip joint. With this direct anterior approach, they go in from the front with a relatively small incision. Rather than cutting the muscles, they merely separate them, retract them apart. And then they do the same type procedure. And in my case, the hip joint is not cemented in. It's merely what's referred to as press fit. Okay, let's see. Is that turning color? Oh, oh yes, it's oh, caramel yeah. color. Okay. Now, I'll, let's see. Let me get back to my directions. And onions, peppers, and celery. Here comes the goodies. Might be too long. I'm going to break it. Like they used to say in the 60s, shake it but don't break it. <laughs> Here go the onions. Oh yeah, go to cooking. And the peppers. Oh yes. Honolulu. So it says to add the onions, peppers, and celery and cook, stirring until the onions soften. About eight minutes. Okay. And back to the hip. The neat thing about this approach, not having the muscles cut, is the fact that your restrictions are much less than they would be with the other type hip replacements. So, uh, a lot of patients who have this type of procedure stay in the hospital just for that day and they leave that afternoon. They don't even spend the night in the hospital. I did spend the night uh, and went home the next day. Yeah. Gosh, you can smell it. It smells terrific. Oh, no. So with this new approach, there's no weight-bearing restrictions. You can walk on it immediately. Matter of fact, I stood up and walked 10 or 15 steps within hours of the surgery. <coughs> How has your life been since you got home? Pain and all that. Well, like I say, my back gets angry from time to time, and that's a that's another issue that has been addressed and will be addressed again. But as far as hip pain, now there's there's what I refer to, and I used to tell patients, there's pain and then there's surgical sore. Yeah, you're going to be sore after surgery. And I have been, but as far as pain that I had before, gone. Matter of fact, the doctor wrote me some pain medication and I took it. I came home on the 25th of November and I had to take one then and two on the 26th. And that's the last pain medication I took.
would I do it again? Oh, in a heartbeat to get rid of that pain I had. deer permit this year and within a week of getting it broke her leg and couldn't hunt anything so <laughs> always next year maybe you'll get one in the night and then another couple that we hold dear in our hearts came and got me the next day and brought me home. It's really humbling to be in the presence of such fine folks. glad and grateful to be getting back to our healthy selves, but you do kind of miss, like when she had her leg broken, I did all the cooking, I did this, I did that, and then when I had my hip replacement, she did all the, the cooking and this and that, and you kind of miss taking care of the other person. <laughs> but like I say, I'm not complaining. I'm glad to be getting back to doing outside, inside. Mm -hmm. The only challenge now is we can do a little bit, but it gets dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was a good time of year for us. Us both to be kind of down because couldn't really do anything. It would have been tough to sit here in the summertime when it stays light until nine o'clock at night and not be able to get out and do things. So hopefully when that rolls around, we will be out there in it. Back in business in the spring. Back in business. I've already been driving. I'm Cloud with the tractor. You veggie soft yet? I would think so. Oh, yeah, that looks good. That's I've been nice. stirring it pretty, yeah. pretty constantly to keep it from sticking to the pan, yeah. So, what's next on our list? Let's see, let's see. So it says, you were supposed to kind of do that for eight minutes, right? And then now you're gonna add in the sausage, the garlic, the Cajun seasoning, and the pepper. <laughs> so you sausage. Should be in order, but you see. Here we go. It called for cutting the sausage in one inch 
rounds, but I quartered it. Yeah, that's just a big bite, I think. You get a lot of sausage in one bite and no sauces in the other bite. How do you like my pot holder? <laughs> These were made out of old jeans with a thumb hold and Muffin made those for me in Idaho. And those are my favorite pot holders. So we gotta keep going with our stuff. All the way through the broth, tomatoes and everything. So what's next? Garlic. So next is the garlic, yeah. Okay. Might be good enough to eat. Mm -hmm. Then we got our Cajun seasoning and pepper. Let me just hand to those. Cajun seasoning and pepper. Anything you cook, if you're a Cajun, you gotta say, Woo! <laughs> Is this whole thing of broth here? Yep. It's gonna help things from sticking and burning. How much do I put in? All of it. All of it. Uh -huh. Ooh. Ooh. Four cups. Now you see how it pops like that? Mm -hmm. If you turn it like this, does it pour better? It don't do that. Oh, that's good because it kind of splashes on the. So your last two ingredients are the tomatoes and the bay leaf. I gotta say woo. Oh that's right, you gotta say woo. <laughs> I had a patient one time. She and I don't know where she was from originally, but her husband was from Louisiana. Let me take a picture of your pots. Okay. Okay, you're supposed to bring that to a boil. I'm going to turn it up. And then we're going to... There, but... Uh, then we're going to uh, simmer it for a while. And, anyway, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Do I put the tomatoes in now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that bay leaf. Okay. So he was from Louisiana, and they were barbers. And they had a barber shop in, it was either Compton or Carson, which is LA County, California. And they were both barbers in their barber shop. And when they retired, they moved into a rural area of North Carolina. And uh, when he would come in to the clinic, I would say, say something Cajun for me. And he would say, let the bon ton roule. <laughs> say it again. Let the bon ton roule. And that means let the good times roll. There's a wonton roulette. And he was a happy rascal. He was a happy rascal. So what we're going to do <coughs> is it says we're going to bring that to a boil. Uh -huh. And then we're going to put it on low and let it simmer for an hour. So okay. we'll probably do that and then come back to the video. Yeah. And these people were pretty well connected because every year they would have a barbecue. This bar these barber couple I'm telling you about. Yeah. And they and their neighbor, the neighbor had a huge barn and they would have a barbecue every year. And most times the Marshall Tucker band came up and played. Oh wow. So they were pretty well connected. I would say. And I talking about the Marshall Tucker band. I had another patient and she was from Spartanburg, South Carolina. 
and that's where the Marshall Tucker band's from. And she ran a small cafe. And from time to time, members of the Marshall Tucker band would come in and eat at that cafe. And she knew them pretty well. And so uh, her name was Frances. And when she would come into the clinic, I'd say, can't you see? Can't you see what old Francis been doing to me? And she'd say, oh, shut up. <laughs> I bet she liked it. She did. The good Lord gave me some interesting patience over the years. Mm -hmm. I had one guy, uh, I've played drums all my life. And I had a guy who was a real, real professional drummer. And uh, he was in the, he had been in the Marine Band. And there's a, a guy that was a real, just a top-notch drummer named Billy Gladstone. And Billy Gladstone made five snare drums and this man had one of them. Oh, wow. And he said that he had been offered, I don't know how much money for one of those drums. And his statement was, talk to my widow when I'm gone. Oh, he wasn't selling it. And, <laughs> and he, would, he had been a, a music teacher, drum teacher. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, uh, have you ever had any famous students that ended up going big time? And uh, one of his students had been Stuart Copeland, that was the drummer for the police. Oh, okay. I didn't recognize and that name. That was name. one of his students. I worked with a fella. He was my, my clinical instructor when I was doing one of my internships. And. We ended up working together for 20 years. And he's a dear friend of mine. I, I don't consider him a friend, I consider him a family. And he hand makes fiddles. And he's made 280 some so far. And uh, doesn't advertise. And some big time names have gotten his fiddles. I know Ricky Skaggs has too. Uh, and I can't tell you all the other. He shipped them to India, Australia, England, Hawaii, all over the world. And when he would finish one, when he would string it up, he used to bring one into the clinic. And he'd say, here, I want you to play it. Well, I can't play a fiddle. But I, I could draw the bow on it. And that's what he wanted. He wanted, he said, if I let a fiddle player play this, he can make it sound good. But somebody who has no ability to play the fiddle, which is me, when I draw the bow on it, that's the raw sound that comes out of that fiddle. And it's boiling now. Oh, good. So we're going to turn it on low. It doesn't say to cover it or anything, okay. so really low because our oven. Yeah, I got it on as low as it'll low. And then <laughs> low as it'll low. we're so, going to come back in about an hour. <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, start. I have I have played more five thousand dollar fiddles than most professional fiddles fiddle players have different fiddles. Yeah. Because I've played oh, oh well over a hundred of them. Oh. that he would bring in and I'd draw the bow on him and people would say, I didn't know you play the fiddle. And I said, I, I can't. <laughs> and that's what he wanted, the raw sound out of it. Right, because a fiddle player could finesse yeah. it or whatever. And do you know the difference in a fiddle and a violin? Uh, no, I don't. If you're selling it, it's a violin. If you're buying it, it's a fiddle. Okay, because it sounds cheaper. <laughs> and do you know what you say to a fiddle player in a three-piece suit? No. Will the defendant please rise? <laughs> <laughs> and you can use.
use that with any <laughs> instrument. But I, that, this guy I'm telling you about, Bob Kogut, just a prince of a human being. Uh, he could play the guitar, bass, fiddle, anything you wanted to play. And I played in band with him. And he played the bass, he's played guitar, he's played the fiddle, and uh, oh, it was just a privilege to play with him. I've played with people who read music, and a couple of them couldn't play unless they had music in front of them. Ooh, that color looks good. We're gonna try. And if you ask them, well, play, play something for me. If they didn't have a sheet of music in front of them, they couldn't play it. But if they had the music, they could play anything in the world and it made it sound good. And so the joke used to be, if somebody was gonna play in the band, they'd say, well, did they read music? And we'd somebody would say, well, yeah, but it hadn't hurt him any. <laughs> and it's crazy because you think that's what you have to do to be able to play well, right? Yeah. I knew Maybe one, that's not the case. I knew one in particular, and she was a classically trained pianist. And could, I mean, she was excellent. But if she didn't have a sheet of music in front of her, she couldn't play anything. That's the only way she knew how to play. Right. If she heard something... She couldn't mimic that sound as good as she was. She had to have the notes in front of her. And she'd been playing for 30 years. Okay, this is at a low boil. Now, it doesn't say a cover there. No, it doesn't. So why don't we put it on the lower burner? The single burner? Yeah. Okay. Because if it just boils all the water out, it's not really what we want. We want it to right. simmer. And I don't, I don't know. I'm not a chef, but I don't know that if it would hurt to put a lid on it. It keeps some of the liquid in, which might be nice because it's already boiling it. low here. Let's do it. All right, and we're going to move from here to cobbler tasting. Yes. Here goes the blueberry cobbler. Still warm, I hope. Probably could have got a better serving thing. <laughs> I look, it's gonna be upside down. It'll eat the same. <laughs> well, that's good and steamy. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, I'm foaming at the mouth so like a, a rabid dog. <laughs> Here we go. Talking about just going on top, man. <laughs> stories. One of my colleagues had a she she worked with pediatrics. Doesn't that look good? <laughs> and so one day she said she was going to go get her notes, and she said, "Here, hold this baby for me." So I was holding the baby, and I loved black cherry milkshakes from this one particular place in town. Okay. And the baby was whimpering. And so I would carry it around, shake it a little bit. And I said, I said, what we need is a black cherry milkshake. I said, oh Lord, send us a black cherry milkshake. I said, that'll make us feel better. And I was, you know, teasing that baby and the baby was kind of laughing and so forth. And if I had to die, I'm telling you the truth. Within three minutes, another patient of mine came in and said here and handed me a black cherry milkshake. From that place. From that place. Hot dog. And and I'm gonna get you to pray for cash. Yeah. <laughs> pray for the lottery. But anyhow, there uh a friend of mine that I text that I worked with in that same clinic. Mm -hmm. 
he told me the other day, he said, I still tell that story yeah. of, of that lady bringing in that milkshake. Yeah. I, said, I, I mean, I was walking around in front of, you know, patients and everybody. I said, oh, Lord. I said, the only thing that make us feel better is a black cherry milkshake. I said, oh, Lord, send us a black cherry milkshake. And within three minutes, that woman walked in and handed me one. She said, here, this is for you. Because she knew, she knew I, I liked them, them too. But, yeah. But Damn. now you talk about, I mean, everybody in that place, their jaw just dropped. <laughs>